Judah had the idea to sell his brother Joseph into slavery. But today we'll see even more unrighteousness from this son of Israel. On The Bible Brief. Joseph is betrayed by his brothers. First, they planned on murdering him. Next, they figured they'd keep their hands clean by allowing him to die in a pit. But finally, on Judah's suggestion, they decided to sell him to some passing traders. Those traders ended up taking a trek south of the land of Canaan and west through the Sinai Peninsula to the burgeoning empire of Egypt. Joseph had gone from the favorite son of Jacob to a presumed dead slave in Egypt. As we'll come to find out, however, this isn't the end of the Joseph story. Now, after telling us where Joseph ended up, the Bible story shifts back to the brother, that same brother who had suggested he be sold in the first place. It shifts back to Judah, the fourth son of Jacob by his unfavored wife, Leah, the son who, by virtue of his older brother's sins against their father, is likely in the running for the great blessing from Jacob, especially since the favorite son was now out of the picture. Things have seemed to work out for Judah so far, but as we'll see today, things begin to quickly unravel before he hits rock bottom. As we look at Genesis chapter 38, we learn that Judah has separated himself from his family, married a Canaanite of all people, and begins to have children by her. Let's read. And again, for parents, this will be one you'll want to screen before listening with your children. Okay, Genesis 38. It happened at that time that Judah went down from his brothers and turned aside to a certain Adulamite, whose name was Hira. There Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, with whom he had three sons. And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. So here we're quickly told some details about Judah's life. He has a Canaanite wife, he has three sons, and he's found a wife for his firstborn named Tamar. Tamar, his first son's wife, becomes the crux of what happens next. But before we move on, we should note the Lord's involvement in Judah's life. And it's not what Judah might have hoped. His eldest son is so wicked that God simply puts him to death. Which isn't only Judah's problem, it's also Tamar's problem. She was given in marriage to Judah's firstborn, but hadn't had any children by him. Now you may say, okay, they can just go their separate ways. But here's where we need to be in the mind of that time period. At this point, customs had developed around marriage and death. Customs that are exactly defined later in the Bible story. Now, these customs involve something called leveret marriage. And simply put, leveret marriage is the idea that If a woman married a man, and the man died without producing any sons by that woman, then that woman was given to the next eldest brother of the man as a wife. In this way, the deceased brother could have nominal offspring, while the widow could find herself in the protection of the deceased brother's family. Said another way, the still-living brother would produce offspring on behalf of the deceased brother. This is important to know for the next development in the story of Tamar and Judah. Then Judah said to his second son, Go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her, and raise up offspring for your brother. But the brother knew that the offspring would not be considered his own, so whenever he went into his brother's wife, he would waste the semen on the ground so as to not give offspring to his brother. And what he did was wicked in the sight of the Lord and he put him to death also. Judah's sons don't have a good track record with the Lord so far. Apparently, this second son of Judah didn't want to dilute his share of the inheritance that he'd gained from his father. Having offspring with Tamar, especially offspring in his older brother's name, would likely mean losing some of his status as the oldest living brother. And so, in a very graphic way, we learn of his sexual sin against Tamar. He was unwilling to have children with her, and as a result, God puts him to death as well. As you can imagine, this didn't sit well with Judah, and he apparently thinks that his sons are dying because of Tamar 
instead of their own sin. So let's keep reading. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in your father's house till my third son grows up. For he feared that he would die like his brothers. So Tamar went and remained in her father's house. Judah has consigned his daughter-in-law to the life of a widow. And because of his authority over her, this means that she's unable to marry unless she's released to do so by Judah. Judah makes no such release. And then the story begins to thicken. In the course of time, the wife of Judah died. When Judah was comforted, he went up to Timnah to his sheep shearers. And when Tamar was told, Your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil, wrapping herself up, and sat at the entrance to Anaim, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that Judah's third son was grown up, and she had not been given to him in marriage. Tamar is planning something drastic, because she's not been given in marriage to Judah's youngest son. She takes off her widow's garments and puts on the clothes of a woman who'd been promised in marriage to another, a veil demonstrating her social position. And in this new attire, she waits for Judah to pass her on the road to shear his sheep. And this is where the story seriously develops. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. He turned to her at the roadside and said, Come, let me come in to you for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, What will you give me that you may come in to me? He answered, I will send you a young goat from the flock. And she said, If you give me a pledge until you send it. He said, What pledge shall I give you? She replied, Your signet, your cord, and your staff that is in your hand. So he gave them to her and went into her, and she conceived by him. Then she arose and went away, And taking off her veil, she put on the garments of her widowhood. At this point, we shouldn't have any questions in our mind as to the character of Judah. Having sold his brother into slavery, having withheld his third son from Tamar despite his promise, having consigned Tamar to a life of widowhood, and having slept with who he presumed to be a prostitute, we know that Judah isn't a very good guy. Unknowingly, Judah has impregnated his daughter-in-law Tamar, and just as unknowingly, Judah will expose his unrighteousness to all. Let's keep reading. About three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has been immoral. Moreover, she is pregnant by her immorality. And Judah said, Bring her out and let her be burned. As she was being brought out, she sent word to her father-in-law, By the man to whom these belong, I am pregnant. And she said, Please identify whose these are, the signet and the cord and the staff. Then Judah identified them and said, She is more righteous than I, since I did not give her to my son Shelah. And he did not know her again. As soon as Judah finds out that his daughter-in-law is pregnant, he immediately puts on his condemnation hat. She had violated her widowhood by sleeping with another man, and she deserved to be burned for it, burning being one of the worst kinds of death used as a punishment in the Old Testament. Yet, almost as soon as the words are out of his mouth, he realizes that his condemnation has been misplaced, as he identifies the signet, the cord, and the staff that he personally had given to the prostitute he'd met on the road. Things click into place in his mind. Judah had unrighteously withheld his third son from Tamar. So Tamar was getting offspring by going to the next nearest male relative, Judah himself. And at this moment of revelation, Judah hits rock bottom. In front of the community and in front of his daughter-in-law, he has been shown to be in the wrong. The deceptive words that he'd said to his father came back to haunt him. He and his brothers had asked Jacob to please examine to see if this is the robe of your son. And in this moment, he was asked to please examine the signet, the cord, and the staff that he'd given to the prostitute. Like a boomerang, deception had come back upon Judah. While deception had hidden his sin against Joseph, deception had revealed his sin against Tamar. But in all this, 
Tamar and Judah aren't the only ones working. Behind the scenes, God has been using this scenario to bring about something for Judah. A pair of offspring that echo the story of Jacob and Esau. See if you can spot the similarities as we see the birth of twins from Tamar's womb. When the time of her labor came, there were twins in her womb. And when she was in labor, one put out a hand, and the midwife took and tied a scarlet thread on his hand, saying, This one came out first. But as he drew his hand back, behold, his brother came out. And she said, What a breach you have made for yourself. Therefore his name was called Perez. Afterward his brother came out with the scarlet thread on his hand, and his name was called Zira. Now remember, Jacob had grasped the heel of his brother and would grasp at his heel for much of his life. But here, the younger brother Perez would defeat his brother in the womb itself, pulling him back to be born first. We don't have the prophetic pronouncement here that the older will serve the younger, but we have the sentiment. Perez, Judah's youngest son by Tamar, will have a special place in the plan of God. Now, these illicit events in chapter 38 are a setup. They help us learn a few things that will continue to drive the story forward. They begin to teach us about leveret marriage as a custom. They teach us about the special place of Perez in the plan of God. And perhaps most importantly for the coming chapters, they teach us about the rock bottom moment for Judah. The prominent brother among the sons of Jacob, sleeping with a prostitute and being found out, being shown to be unrighteous. The question we're left with is this. Will Judah stay at rock bottom, or will he make a turnaround? As we await the answer to that question, the Bible story shifts back to the favorite son of Jacob, back to Joseph, the one sold by his brothers to a future of slavery, the one whose life is about to get even worse, as his Egyptian master's wife begins an effort to seduce Joseph. Will Joseph succeed where Judah failed? Will he be able to resist a woman who won't be resisted? Join us next time as we see Joseph begin a new life in Egypt. The Bible Brief is brought to you by the Bible Literacy Foundation, dedicated to helping people like you learn the Bible.